I invite everybody please to take your seat and we'll begin the highlight lecture. So, so my name is Christian Salberger. I'm the uh, chairman of the Space Exploration Committee of the IAF, and it's my pleasure to introduce our highlight lecture for this evening. Um, you know, I, I've had an experience that I'm sure you've all shared. As we look up into the night sky and we see all the stars, and we wonder, you know, we, we, we think of those stars as being like our sun, and we wonder, are there Earth-like planets around those other stars or not? And if there are, how many? And those are, are big questions that people have wondered for a long time. So it's, uh, it's uh, our, uh, our privilege today to be able to, to hear about that from uh, one of the experts in the field, uh, William Baraki. So um, William Baraki began, uh, I guess, his career with uh, graduate studies at the University of Wisconsin in 1962. He then uh, joined NASA Ames in California, where he worked on the Apollo mission heat shield. And then following the Apollo program, he uh, went to work on the theoretical aspects of planetary atmospheres. Um, he, uh, this work continued and then in uh, around 1984 he started advocating for a mission to detect Earth-like planets around other stars. And uh, that led to him uh, becoming the principal investigator of the Kepler mission, which was launched in 2009. Uh, he's received numerous awards, uh, I'll list just a few. He was, uh, he's received the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, he's uh, had the uh, Popular Mechanics Breakthrough Award. Uh, in 2010 he was given the uh, NASA Systems Engineering Excellence Award. Uh, last year he received the Lancelot M. Berkeley Prize for uh, meritorious work in astronomy. And so without further ado, let me introduce William Baraki. Good evening. Uh, I have the privilege of talking to you. Can people hear me? Can people hear me now? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, in any case, to tell you about the, uh, the Kepler mission, and I've been, I've been asked as well to talk about some of the technical challenges uh, of the mission. The Kepler mission is a, a, a NASA mission that is orbiting the sun. It's basically designed to find the frequency of Earth-side planets in and near the habitable zone the stars very much like that of the sun. And if it finds many, there may very well be a lot of life in our galaxy. If it finds none or very few, we may be the only extant alive in our galaxy. The tragedy of that, of course, would be no star -like. There's no place to go to. So whatever answer we get, uh, I think is going to be very uh, important in the uh, exploration of our galaxy for life. The uh, mission objectives are down there. Uh, I've mentioned the frequency that we're trying to determine, but we're also trying to determine the size distribution of the planets, how many earth size, Mars size, double earth size. And we want to associate whatever results we get with the stars they orbit. I always like to start out when I, I give this talk and talk about a parody. What do we think about when we think about uh, the formation of planets? And given that those ideas, how do the facts uh, modify uh, what we what we believe. And so this is a, an example of, of what people think uh, occurs when planets form. We have a galaxy that has large mole giant molecular clouds uh, when they're disturbed, particularly if there is a supernova, compresses part of this cloud, the cloud becomes self-gravitating, and as it collapses inward, it maintains its angular momentum and spins up to a flat disk. A flat disk 
Uh, it can explain a lot, uh, in particular, why all the planets are on the same plane. Why are the planets going together uh, and, uh, uh, and prograde a orbit? Because it's all being formed from this disk. The material is falling into the star, the star uh, has a spin axis, and what we find is the spin axis is nearly perpendicular to the orbit of the plane, and many of the planets in our solar system have their spin axis oriented again perpendicular to the plane, what you might expect. It's also been used to explain uh, uh, the singular uh, solar system that we knew about just uh, about 15 years ago, the own solar system, in that we can see that if the planets were to come out of this dust and gas disk and condense out, that if you're close to the star, it would be so hot that all you could expect to condense out were rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Further out, the, the gas is much colder, you can get the ices, and as the planet grows to, to, to large size, and it would because it's out a long distance, there's a lot of material that can be uh, gathered uh, when the planet forms. I think that that's shown a little bit. I see I should uh, move up to the next figure. This is the figure I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Uh, and the, gi the giant plants are, of course, further out, and as, as such, they gather more material, and they're colder, so you can see where the giant plants might, might form out here. So that was our paradigm. This is what we believed, and not that many years ago, was going to be representative of all the plants that we found. There was actually communication by a committee uh, to NASA saying there was no need to look for Earths. You'd find Jupiter's out of five astronomical units, and of course, there would be Earths. Uh, and of course, we finally got the technology in 1995 to begin finding planets around the stars and uh, with greater velocity and uh, then in 2000 with uh, the first uh, transit, uh, transit uh, detections. And what we found, of course, was it was quite different than we expected in many, many ways. In particular, we knew that the giant planets had to fall far out, five astronomical units, but what we found, the first one was found with an orbital period not of one year, or one month, but four days. So somehow this giant planet came, had appeared at, uh, so close to the star. Did it form there? If so, where did the material to form from? And so people began looking at that, uh, at the what might have caused that, and what they found, in fact, is that these planets probably migrated inward. And the supercomputer examples they did, shown here, here the star lies to the here the star lies to the left of that uh, c uh, computing area. The little band there is part of this accretion disk of dust and gas. And in the center of that little dark spot is where the uh, planet is forming. As the planet forms, it becomes denser than the surrounding material. It becomes a, a, pl a planet embryo or a massive object. And consequently, it's not pressure supported. The gas is pressure supported, so its velocity is always faster than the gas that it's embedded in. And consequently, it's going to form a wave. The wave is shown here with these, these, um, these spiral marks here and here. So this planet, as it moves through this disk, is forming this wave. It's very much like a powerboat going across a lake. It's generating a wave. And when the motor shuts down, the, the boat stops, the wave stops, because it's no longer provide, the motor is no longer providing energy to generate that wave. So this planet is also generating wave, but it has no motor. So the energy it's giving up is its potential energy, and so this, this planet is falling into its star. The wave is a little bit complex here, uh, in that uh, you can see that it's not V-shaped, but this part of the disk is moving very slowly compared to it, so that it gets stretched out. And this part of the wave, the part of the disk is moving very rapidly, so it pulls the, uh, uh, the wave in front of it. So it's, the, uh, it's very much like the boat are going across the lake. The technical challenge here is to build a theory that tells us how does this planet spiraling into its star stop? And we'll talk about that uh, shortly. What we want to talk about for a minute is the habitable zone. The habitable zone is a very fuzzy concept. Uh, but here what we're showing is that if the planet is close to the star, it can be so hot 
the ocean floor can be so hot, in fact, the, the rock boils. And so you're too close to the star. In the region that's marked in blue, you're too far away from the star. It's too cold. The oceans are solid. They're solid ice. You want to be in that region between the fire and the ice, the region where you can have water on the surface of a, of a rocky planet. That's where you believe that the evolution of life uh, has the highest chance of happening. The other aspect of what we see here is that habitable zone, the zone marked in green, is very large and has very large orbit, long orbital period for the most massive stars. It's rather short of, of the order of a year for the stars like that of the sun, and it could be even shorter for the many small stars that uh, are in our galaxy. There the orbit appears to the habitable zone are in the order of a month. When we try to find these planets, you know, the first thing we think about is, let's build a big telescope, and let's go look at these stars and look at the planets that orbit the stars. It doesn't work. Uh, a star is generally about 10 billion times brighter than a planet. Consequently, that light floods into the telescope, scatters around the optics, and completely overwhelms the planet. So what we do instead is we look at the fact that a planet influences the star itself in several different ways, one of which is shown here. The planet that is in front of the star blocks some light. So for measuring the brightness of that star constantly, we see the starlight dip for a while, a few hours generally, come back up, stay constant, and come back around, and again we see a dip for the next orbital period. So that's basically what we're going to do. We're going to look for that dip. The dip tells us the area of the planet to the area of the star, so we can get the area or the size of the planet from that dip. We can get the orbital period from repetition rate. We need to, to estimate the mass of the star. We have Kepler's third law, and we can derive the distance of the planet from the star. We can measure the temperature of the star, we can measure its area, and we can then get at how hot that planet must be. And that can tell us, in fact, whether it's in a habitable zone or not. Great method, except for the fact it only works if the, eclipse, the orbital planes in your line is sunk. What's the probability that will happen if, if the orbital planes are randomly oriented in our galaxy? The answer is most proportional how big the star is, inversely proportional how big the orbit is. And that number is about 10% for planets that have very short orbital periods, a few days, a week or so. But it's about half a percent for a planet out as far as the Earth in the habitable zone. So clearly this is not a good method if you're saying, I want to point at that star and ask, does it have planets? The orbits might not be oriented properly. But if you say, I'm going to look at 100,000 stars, half a percent times 100,000 is several hundred planets you should see. And so if you see that many, most of those stars have planets in the habitable zone. If you don't, uh, you know, it might be quite rare in our galaxy. So that's basically how we do this. We're going to do ensemble photometry of a huge number of stars assigned to Kansas. I've also been asked to talk about the technical challenges uh, to do the job, and so I'm going to start out with some of the challenges that we had when we started uh, developing the mission uh, in, in 1984. Uh, basically, what we had to do uh, is demonstrate that it was reasonable to talk about the detection of transits of Earth-sized planets, given what we knew about stars like the Sun and the noise and the variability they would have in the detectors uh, that we might have. The next thing that we were asked uh, to do uh, in, in, a, in a proposal phase was to demonstrate that you could do photometry of thousands of stars and do an automated, automated uh, analysis uh, of that. At, at that time, uh, people generally, when they did photometry, they would point the telescope at a single star, measure its brightness, move the telescope, measure another star that was similar to it, which was your comparison star, and then move it again a third time to a reference star, because your comparison star might be variable too. And just repeat that over and over again, because the atmosphere's transmission was changing with time. You might get through 20 stars during the night, and then of course the next day you could analyze that. But that's not what we are talking about this mission. This mission, you have to do 100,000 stars. You have to do them simultaneously. So we had to show we could do that uh, as well. Uh, we had to uh, identify detectors that would do provide 10 part per million photometry. None were known when we started. 
And finally, we had to demonstrate that you could do this on orbit, because on orbit you have different kinds of noise than you do here on Earth. One of which is the fact that when you point at these stars, the telescope is not bolted to the ground, it's not stable, it's pointed constantly by reaction wheels, reaction wheels aren't perfectly spherical, and so the thing jiggles, and the image jiggles. And that is, in fact, one of the biggest sources of noise that you have to put up with. So let's start out with the first uh, uh, challenge. Uh, those of you who were here last night saw the talk by uh, Roger Maurice Bonnet, where he talked about the sun and the variability of the sun and all the mass ejection events uh, that occur. And the uh, lower left, there what you see is a solar, uh, solar mass ejection event, uh, much, much larger than that of the Earth. And so you can see that you certainly wouldn't want that to hit the Earth. Uh, you want to diffuse out by the time it hits the Earth. But this, this sort of thing occurs reasonably often. And you're never going to find that planet crossing the star. If you look in the ultraviolet, you must cut out the ultraviolet. And so that's one of the first things we talk about doing. And you can see the next image next to it is just the visible light. And now you can see the little blue dot, that little blue dot, as uh, uh, Bonnet showed, is about the size of a, of a small uh, sunspot. The difference is, however, the sunspots are attached to the star as well as the plaza, so they move with the star over periods of days and weeks, whereas a, the planet is a zips across, zips across in a few hours. A couple of hours for planets in short period orbits, about 10 hour, or hours for planets in orbits like that of the, of the Earth. And so that fact that it's a short pulse you're looking for and it's extremely repetitive tells you it's an orbiting object, it is not a spot. Spots are random, they come and go as they, uh, as they, they wish, basically. Uh, so, so we're going to need to see at least three transits. We're not going to be able to take the planet with one transit or two. We've got to see the orbit uh, period uh, is repetitive, that it indeed matches one orbit measurement with another to generally a part of 10,000 or 100,000. We've got to show that we can do automated photometry of thousands of stars. Basically, what the review panel said when they rejected our proposal was, we'll just go out and build an observatory and show it can be done. So we built that observatory. The observatory was in a dome that was not being used at Lick, at Mount Hamilton in California, and what you see. And what you see in the upper left are two of the small telescopes that we built. Uh, at first, the tell the system was not fully automated, so we had observers there uh, to monitor the operation. One of our observers was a fellow called Spock. He had rather strange characteristics, very much like uh, the fellow in, in uh, Star Trek. Uh, his uh, characteristic was that he liked to, to eat wires, and so he was not a very welcome, a welcome guest. And in the middle, you actually can see one of the transits that we detected at Oak Planet orbiting another star. We were able to monitor some 6,000 stars and show that we could do the photometry after the radio signal had been sent back from the observatory, not to Earth, but back to NASA Ames, where we reduced the data. We published that, and I think that satisfied uh, the people on the review panel. But nevertheless, we proposed again, the proposal was rejected, <coughs> and that was for the fourth time. So what uh, we are being asked to do here is to show in a laboratory that you get 10 parts per million photometry with the noise that would occur on orbit. And that's what we're show showing here. And basically on the left-hand side is a box, a thermal chamber that you're looking into that's about 10 feet high. It keeps the temperature very constant. And inside at the bottom is a light source with a filter that makes the light look very much like sunlight. It goes in that blue sphere at the bottom and that's, that scatters the light in a very uniform fashion. It comes up through a plate, and that plate, we've laser drilled thousands of holes, little ones for dim stars, big ones for big stars, and at different distances, so we can see how the system will work with stars as they are close and far apart from one another. At the top is a little telescope, very much like the one we would fly in orbit. And there are uh, piezoelectric uh, uh, motion uh, systems that shake that little telescope just like the power spectrum of the real telescope uh, would. And as well, is it allows us to move the telescope very, very carefully and see how the motion changes the output of those detectors. And what you can see here 
is we we're moving in X and Y in these three cases, and we see the output change. This uh, uh, image the, uh, uh, gets increases with with uh, position. This one decreases with position. Some of these are double humped, and this is showing how the centroid of the image motion moves across a pixel. Are we moving parallel to the top, parallel to the side, toward the center, away from the center? All those things matter, uh, but I'll end up finding that what we need to do is we need to get uh, one controlled motion to about a millipixel so we can get 17 part per line change in output. And so clearly we're going to have to track with uh, very high precision. But this is with CCD detectors. This is a proof that CCD detectors, which generally give you a tenth of a percent, can do a hundred times better than that. And that is because we measure the systematic errors and we correct them. This is our instrument. This is the instrument that we built uh, for, the, for the mission. And basically it's a wide field of view photometer. It's going to measure over 100,000 stars. In fact, it measures 170,000 stars simultaneously. We would use it for several years to get patterns of transits. We mustn't miss transits, they're short. So what you do is you look at a single field of view with a lot of stars, measuring all these stars, uh, and to do that continuously, you have to be in heliocentric orbit, which allows you to look at these stars 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, so you don't miss transits. The, we, we have six second integrations, we add them up either to one minute or 30 minute, uh, sums, and then we store them aboard the spacecraft and send them to the ground where we do our photometry. The uh, photometry is done on the ground and only for those stars that are chosen. We have, before the mission launched for three years, we looked at 4.4 million stars in this field of view, measured each of those, and determined which ones were basically good candidates, bright enough, similar to our sun. And so we, we send back just the data on those stars. Uh, to get the statistically valid results, we must look at a large number of stars, and that must mean you have to have a wide field of view telescope. That means Schmidt-type design. This is a Schmidt-type system. Uh, you can see the uh, corrector here at the top. There, the light comes in, hits the primary mirror, reflected the detectors. The detectors change the uh, photons to electrons, put in the, uh, uh, the electronics, which digitizes it. The system is very, very, has a huge field of view, and very fast, actually, as well. The field of view here is about 40,000 times larger than that of the Hubble's tail telescope. It is larger than the ground-based telescopes, which have a field of view of about six degrees in diameter. This is 15. And there is no such thing for this system as a focal plane. There's a focal surface, but it's very, very curved. And that's shown here. This, this is about a square foot of detectors. And because we can't focus on these flat detectors, uh, we cover them with silicon uh, lens, I'm sorry, sapphire lenses to flat feel the, the, the uh, images just before they hit the detectors. The other thing to note here is that there are four little CCDs in the corners. These are the, these are the fine guidance sensors. They're the ones that each look at about a dozen stars each on the focal plane and allow this telescope to track to a hundredth of an arc second, three sigma over 30 minutes. We do as well as the Hubble Space Telescope. We track so well that the same star stays on the same pixels for several months at a time. The biggest change, in fact, the biggest motion of those stars is the fact that as your spacecraft, which is traveling at fractional speed of light, moves toward the star field, the whole star field contracts. And as it moves away, the star field expands. And so we actually see the stars move across our pixels because our pixels are constant and the stars, star field is not. The uh, system here is shown here. This is the throughput. You can see the transmission of the correct, the uh, corrector, I'm sorry, right there, uh, the silver reflectance of that mirror, the, the CCD, and the filter that covers the sapphire detectors that cut off, cuts off the ultraviolet. The black is the, uh, the uh, throughput of the instrument. We do cut off at the calcium H and K lines and get, get rid of the ultraviolet. We cut off a little bit of the, the infrared as well. But basically, it's just looking at visible light.
spacecraft is in orbit, it was launched in 2009, and we now want to talk a little bit about our current challenges. The first is that at the very level, low levels, the 10 parts per million level that we're talking about, even the tiniest noise sources are important to us. And then we do have noise sources, uh, noise in the electronics in particular. We call it rolling band, there's guider noise, there's oscillating amplifiers, etc. And so every time we get a frame, we have to calibrate every single pixel on that frame, and I'll show you. Another challenge that we have is that we have to guide very, very accurately, and when we launched, we had four reaction fields to do this guidance. Well, one of those was a spare. We now have lost one of those four wheels. It uh, developed friction and stopped. So we only have three. The guiding is still great, but they've all had over a billion revolutions. And our worry is that if we lose another one, this mission terminates. We cannot track very well with two. We cannot track good enough to find planets. So we're trying to understand how do we protect those last three wheels. People have studied these reaction, re reaction wheels over the years and never come up with a good answer. We're trying to pick the best knowledge from all that we can learn about other wheels and what we've determined is keep the wheels warm, don't let them go through zero, and make sure they go uh, part of the time clockwise and part of the time clock counterclockwise. We've uh, instigated that uh, with the uh, systems and we're hoping that will protect those wheels uh, for the coming years. This is an example of the noise that we, we get on our detectors. Uh, what you see are uh, the rows of the CCD and the columns of the CCD. Uh, we, this takes about six seconds, and consequently our fine guidance sensors that you saw at the corners, which are running at 10 hertz, are injecting every time they, they're finished with the measurement. They move the whole set of uh, measurements to another piece of the detector, and so you see the frame transfer. That's the noise injected here, injected there, injected here, and so on. But it's very regular. Everything's run by a master clock. So we measure that very accurately, we correct for it, we do the subtraction. Now once there, that CCD image is sent over to the other area, it's got to read down a comma. So when it reads a comma, it's this little black bar that you see these many little black bars, and we measure those and we correct those. Well, after it's read the column down, of course, it's going to read every single pixel in that column, and so that's all these little dots here. So we calibrate every single pixel for every single frame uh, for that. The other noise here is the fact that this system has to run very fast. There's 95 million pixels. You've got to read that whole thing out in, nine, in six seconds. And consequently, the CCD, the uh, amplifiers, uh, ring a little bit. And so you see they're ringing. You see the bounce of the, uh, of the, uh, see the uh, amplifiers here. The other difficulty is the slew rate is so fast in the electronics that we actually get uh, some of the, uh, the uh, amplifiers to oscillate. When they oscillate, the high frequency oscillation beats with those master clocks. And what we see is a band here of noise, and that noise is a function of the temperature. Although we regulate to a hundredth or a thousandth of a degree, that moves slowly through the frame. You've got to find out where it's at and correct for it. It also beats with other things, and you see this very odd area here. That area we can identify, but we can't correct. It's just too complex. And consequently, these pixels, basically for every frame, are found and omitted. And so we cannot use that in the detection mode. Makes the, 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 the analysis of the data much more complex and much more expensive. Another problem, uh, a big surprise, a really, really big surprise here. This, this is the uh, variability of stars like the sun. Now, when we proposed this mission, we had to tell people what we would find. And what we would find depended on the, the uh, variability of stars like the sun. No one had ever measured any star to the precision that was required, 10 parts per million, other than the sun. That has not done by, by a photometer, it was done by a radiometer. The SMM mission that uh, Bonet talked about, the SOHO mission, did measure to 10 parts per million. And so we had to extrapolate from what we knew about the sun to other stars that were measured like the sun. What we expected was that the 
If you look at the, the sun, it's about 4.5 billion years old. Galaxies, the universe is 13.6 billion years old. So the sun is a new star. It's only a third the, the age of the galaxy. So stars like the sun should spin, up more, or spin more slowly, be less active, and they should be quieter than the sun. And that was what we, uh, what we bet at that they would be at least as quiet as the sun. A third would be noisier, we wouldn't be able to get Earth around this. What we found is what you see here. Uh, what we found is that here's the sun, down at 10 or 11 parts per million uh, precision, uh, I'm sorry, variability, at periods of interest to six hours, 12 hours, and so on. But what we see, there are a few stars that are quieter than the sun. But look at this. Two thirds of the stars are noisier than the sun. How can that be? We're, to, we're matching temperatures, we're matching uh, brightnesses. So we don't understand, we don't understand why the sun isn't like the rest of the stars. So it's uh, quite a surprise to us and to others as well. If we look at the numbers, we see that when the mission was designed, we expected Poisson noise to be 15 parts per million, instrument seven, stellar gravity 10, and when you are uh, the uh, uh, root square sum this, you get 20 parts per million for the overall precision of your measurements for 12 magnitude stars. What we measured on orbit is 16 here, pretty close. 14 double the instrument noise, didn't like that. And 20 parts per million for stellar variability. And so that's 30 parts per million. 30 parts per million compared to 20 parts per million has a 50% increase in your noise. That means you can't find Earth before transits. You must double the number of transits. This mission cannot accomplish this objective in four years, it must go to eight years. And so we went to headquarters uh, earlier this year, told them our problem, competed with money, uh, with several other missions, including Hubble, and we were able to get funds to continue the mission for an additional four years. And so we believe that we will ultimately find Earth-side planets around stars as hot as that of the sun. In fact, we might find it a bit earlier if we can find a similar star to being quieter than the sun. What we found, what we have found up to now, is some 2,300 planetary candidates, candidates that have good signals that we believe will represent represent planets. But you've got to do more. You've got to prove that every one of those signals comes from a real planet. It doesn't come from a little star crossing big star. It doesn't come from a binary star whose light is mixed in to your target star. So we do ground-based observations with an array of telescopes, a dozen telescopes uh, throughout the world, from Spain through Hawaii, uh, checking that it can't be anything else. We have, however, confirmed about 100 planets that these are planets, we've made all the measurements, we are extremely confident that these, in fact, are not false positives. And what we see here are uh, the, the planets we've confirmed this slide is a little bit out of date. Every week or two, new planets are confirmed. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, I believe another, uh, I believe about 40 planets were confirmed. So this number is up over 100 at this point. What we see here for size compares to Jupiter, Neptune, and Earth. And we notice there are a group of planets bigger than Jupiter. Now, of course, that can't happen. Our theory was that there were not, would not be any planets bigger than Jupiter. Because if you took extra mass and you threw it on the top of Jupiter, Jupiter doesn't get bigger. It just gets denser. Whether you throw a brick, you throw the Earth in, it's all the same. It dissolves in Jupiter, and Jupiter should get denser. But what we're finding is planets quite a bit bigger than Jupiter, so how do we explain that? Of course, theorists love this. This is new data, new things to think about, and their current theory is that these giant planets have strong winds like Jupiter does, but they're further down, where the temperature's high, where those winds, in fact, are moving ions. And consequently, you have ions being moved in a magnetic field, you're generating electrical currents, those electrical currents are heating the interior of the planets, and consequently, they're expanded like we're finding. So, I don't know whether that's true, I don't know what the theoreticians will think up a few weeks from now, but at least we're learning more about things that uh, are out there. We're also finding planets quite a bit smaller than Earth. Here are planets a little bit less than Earth, we're certainly finding planets uh, below the size of, of, of Mars, and we actually predicted we would find planets uh, as small as Mercury. But again, in short period orbits, where we see lots of transits, where the, uh, the signal can come up out of the universe. Here's 
here are one of the planets that we have found. This is one of the ones that's near Earth's size, 1.4 times the size of the Earth. It's over the period, however. This is the first rocky planet that we confirmed. We actually able to do mass work with radio velocity measurements with the Keck telescope. Uh, a little bit bigger than a little bit bigger than the Earth at 1.4. The mass is four and a half times the size of the Earth, and the density is 8.8 .8 grams per cc. That may not ring a bell for you, but 8.0 is the density of iron. This thing has an average density greater than iron. So as you get the mass gets that that large and planet expands to 40% larger than the Earth, you're actually compressing the iron, running its density. So uh, we're seeing a very, very uh, interesting planets. So this planet uh, has a temperature of some 1800 Kelvin, and it's molten. So clearly, the, the can be nearby. This is a, uh, a system with two planets. The star that has two planets orbiting it, and this uh, was announced about I believe about three weeks ago, uh, these two planets are in orbits very, very near each other. There are about 10% difference in the or orbit distances of these two planets. Well, we think about that formation of, of planets in our own solar system. Close planets, you know, like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, all rocky. Well, these two, very close together, they have a density of uh, 7.5. Earth is 5.5. This is nearly the density of iron. This is a rocky planet. This one right next to it has a density less than that of water. It's very much like Saturn. So how could these two planets forming very next to each other have such different, different compositions? It's warning us we probably are not thinking properly about this disk and how planets form in it. And consequently, our understanding of our own solar system will probably undergo a lot of change uh, in the coming years. This is another system that we found. Instead of two planets orbiting one star, what we're seeing here is six planets orbiting one star. We see transits for all of them. And the orbits here are quite, quite compact. All of them are inside the orbit of Venus, projected onto the, our orbit of our planetary system. The five inside are well inside the orbit of Mercury. The temperatures are extremely hot. Consequently, reasoning from our own solar system, all these planets must be refractory. They must be like Mercury, dense. But they're not. Here are the measurements of density. 3.1, half the density of rocks of, uh, of Earth. 2.3, 0 0.9, 0 0.5. Very close in planets, they're all very much less dense than that for the Earth. So again, it's telling us these planets form in a very special way. They're not forming in a fashion that we used to explain our own solar system. So again, uh, this is a warning that we don't know as much about our solar system as we might have hoped. Uh, people sometimes ask, well, how do you tell these planets apart? Well, the outer planets, of course, move much more slowly across the star than inner ones do. So if you see a transit that long, it's an outer planet. If you see one this short, that's the inner planet. So it's very easy for us to identify these planets. And the data here shows us that they interfere with one another in their orbital periods, and that allows us to get masses, and thus densities. This is the uh, first planet in the habitable zone that Kepler uh, has confirmed. This planet's 2.4 times the size of the Earth. Uh, it is in the habitable zone. Uh, it has an orbital period here of uh, 290 days, not that dissimilar than the Earth. Uh, we don't know what its mass is. Uh, it's big enough, so we think this may not be a rocky planet. It might be a water planet. Kind of composed of water, water and ice, or it might be a planet more like that of uh, Neptune, where you may have rocky material, but there's an enormous amount of atmosphere, uh, hydrogen and helium atmosphere. The telescopes, the great telescopes of the Earth, are now looking at this star, trying to detect the radio velocity signature of this planet, and thus get the mass and density and find out whether this is indeed a rocky or ice world. We hope to have that answer in fact by the end of the year. Up to now, we've talked about single, single planets around single stars. We've talked about planetary systems around single stars. But we know that if you look up at the sky and point at a star and say, that's a pretty star. I wish upon that star. Well, the star you're pointing to is probably a double star, or a triple star, or a quadruple star. 
Only about half the stars that you see in the sky are single stars like our sun. The sun is rather unusual. And so, what about planets around double stars? And the answer is, well, we have found a planet around a double star. And uh, this is a, 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 a picture that we, we swipe from uh, Star Wars with Luke Skywalker walking off to do his evening chores. And the double star that we see here. Now, this is corrected from Tatooine. Uh, and particularly if you look here, the big star is bright and white, and the little is blue and red. Now, in Star Wars, they've got the colors backwards. So we called up George Lucas and said, look, there's a, a factual error in your Star Wars movie. But George enjoyed the humor, and he sent out some of his people to the press conference, although he didn't promise he would correct uh, some of the other factual errors. But what we see here, then, is a planet uh, that's orbiting these two stars. But if we look at the temperature here, it's too cold. Mine is 126 Fahrenheit, colder than even a cold night uh, in the Antarctic. And it's too big. This is a Jovian-like planet. Uh, and so we've got to continue to look for Luke Skywalker's home. Now, this is our next attempt at finding his home. Uh, and again, we have the double, we have the double star. We have the double stars here. And now we have two planets orbiting them, a planetary system. And one of them, uh, which has an orbital period of 300 days, uh, is, is about four and a half times the size of the Earth, but it's the habitable zone. So again, we're finding another planet in the habitable zone. And the star, in a planet like this, this mass, could certainly have uh, planets orbiting it, moons orbiting it, that might be Earth size. So uh, again, we're, we're getting closer to finding that Earth around stars, but we're, we're certainly not there. What I'd like to talk about next is the statistics that we're getting, the results that we're getting from these 2,300 planetary candidates that we have found. In the next couple of weeks, there will be more data that's released that we have uh, looked at, and there will be an additional about 800 to 900 candidates, the numbers will go up to about 3,000. About 80% of those, we believe, will be confirmed as plants. But let's look at what we can learn from these candidates. First of all, we see that uh, for planets about Earth's size, up to one quarter the size of the Earth, we see 250, 246. Again, a little bit bigger than Earth, up to twice the size of the Earth, 676. So planets that might have atmospheres, planets that could, if they were in a habitable zone, have like almost a thousand of these. So we're finding a lot of small planets. We're just not finding them in a habitable zone. Uh, Neptune-sized planets, 1,100, Jupiter, 271. So we're beginning to get a size distribution that we talked about of these planets. What's important What's important to realize here is that when you have a survey, like the Kepler survey, there are biases, and they are strong biases. What we observe and what's out there are two very different things. You need to recognize and compensate and correct for it. If, for example, we had a constant number of planets as a function of semi-major axis, would you expect to see a constant number of planets as a function of semi-major axis? The answer is no, you wouldn't, because what we talked about was the probability that you will see a planet. You will, because the alignment of that planet is prop for you, is available for you to see it, falls as one over the semi-major axis. That's what we talked about at the, the beginning, and that implication is shown with this dashed curve. Here's how a uniform uh, distribution of planets should fall with distance. Well, clearly that curve reduces the, the uh, uh, unexplained variance very, very nicely, but it's certainly not very good. We have a lot of planets here that are unexpected and too few here. Well, that's another bias. We have planets that are close to the star, show lots of transits, so they come up out of the noise, we can see little ones and we can see big ones. But over here, we don't see little ones. They haven't gone through enough transits. So there's many, many biases in our observations. And so you need to be very careful when you look at the observations to say, that means such and such is the case. We go through a very lengthy process to try to correct for that, and generally we cannot correct completely from any of these biases at this time, because we have not uh, 
determine some factors that are important. This is one of my favorite figures. I, I just never uh, failed to show this. We've broken up the candidates down to four size groups, Earth size, super Earth size, Neptune, Jupiter size. And we said, how many do you find as a function of semi-major axis or orbital period, two are related? But what you see here is a nice fall off toward longer orbital periods. We understand what's happening here. But what about the fact that we always see a maximum with orbital periods of three days? Why three days? Why should there be a maximum? And certainly why is that constant with all planet sizes? Well, that's a very interesting question. And, and when you look at that and you think about the secretion disk, well, we're just talking about migrating planets into their, through the accretion disk. They're falling into their star. What stops them? What if they came moving into their star, their rotation period was longer than the rotation period of the star? Well, that's what's expected. That star is rotating really fast because it's a brand new star. It's got all the angular momentum from that disk, and so it rotates very rapidly. Well, this planet is, is orbiting with a 3D orbital period. It's a molten planet. It has huge tides on it, and it's raising tides in that star. As long as that star is rotating more rapidly than that orbital period, the star will take its momentum and transfer it to that planet and stop that planet from falling in. It'll park the planet. So these planets have come into park, parking orbit, and then at some point the star lights up, blows away the dust and gas. That means that planet is no, no longer generating a wave. It's no longer losing energy. It's in the parking orbit, and this is a great place to be. Well, you know, that's a great theory, great idea, it's probably correct. But let's look at all the planets people are finding that have short period orbits, one-day period orbits, two-day period orbits. How did they come about? Were they just lucky they came spiraling into their star, and just at that moment, the star lit up and blew away the dust and gas? Very low, very low likelihood. But what if, in fact, this was a planet in a parking orbit? It's a three-day orbit, it's a molten planet, there are high tides on it and on the star. That doesn't change. But that, that star is losing momentum. It's giving off these mass ejection events. It's got a producing a magnetic field. It's losing its momentum. It's slowing down. At some point, it slows down so that its rotation period is longer than three days. Now it's the turn of the planet to give up its angular momentum and its energy to that star and it now resumes its, its uh, uh, fall into that star. And that's, I think, what we're seeing here. It's planets that are now uh, descending into their star. This is one of the uh, efforts that we made uh, to explain what we were doing to headquarters to get the funds to continue this mission, because it was a four-year mission, now it needs to be an eight-year mission. What we've tried to do here is correct for many of these uh, biases. We don't claim to have done a completely successful job, but what we see here is already, I think, particularly interesting to at least look at. What we see here is the planet size, giant planets here, or size planets over there, and the number of the fraction that we've seen uh, uh, for these various sizes in a very restricted orbital period size so that we see quite a few at any given uh, size here. What we see is a, you can draw a very smooth curve going up through here. That curve is actually linear in a log plot. Uh, and people expected when they saw this for all these giant planets that this curve as it continued upward would predict how many small planets you would find. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't come close. And we don't think that difference is going to be completely explained as we find smaller and smaller planets. It might, but we don't think so. And so how do we interpret the data that you've already found? Well, the answer is imagine that you're in the secretion disk and you're uh, out of a far out orbit like Jupiter is. You've got a lot of mass. You quickly build up a, a core of 10 times the mass of the Earth. At that point, the hydrogen and helium gas are falling out of the planet and you build a giant planet. And so these embryos that are scattered among uh, that gas are trying to build giant planets. At some point, however, the star lights up, blows the dust and gas away, game's over. Game's done. You either got that gas or you didn't get that gas. And consequently, the distribution 
of the drying plant is given by this curve. It says, here are the probabilities that planets were able to get enough gas to, for and to build that mass and become a giant planet before the star lit up. These objects here were embryos. They were the solid planets that were too small to get any gas at all. And they were left over uh, at, at, when the, the gas and, and dust flew away. They are the rocky planets. And they no longer see the gravitational interaction of that disk. And consequently, they see each other. They start scattering, and they collide with one another, just like the Earth was probably built, and just like the moon was probably built. So what we're seeing, possibly, are the formation of clues of rocky planets here and giant planets here. So again, clues as to the formation of planets in planetary systems. I mentioned earlier, of course, that we the habitable zone of hot stars is orbital periods of years, that of the Earth a year, and so we need to see three or four years worth of data to find any. Uh, but what about the small stars? And this is uh, what we're finding generally around small stars. Here are planets in a habitable zone of their stars. These are candidates. These are not confirmed. What we have here is the uh, size of the planet, one size of Earth, four size of Neptune, 11 size of Jupiter, and here are their temperatures. Now these now are not the temperatures of the surface. We don't know what that is. But what we can tell you is if you've got a planet that's being heated by a star, it has an equilibrium temperature that it must radiate the heat away. And so this would be typically the upper atmosphere temperature, or if it has no atmosphere, it would be the surface temperature. And the green range here is telling you that if you had made the assumption that if the planet if it has a solid surface and has an atmosphere similar to the sun, then the surface temperature would be in the range uh, the surface temperature would be in the range of less than the boiling point of water and somewhat above the freezing point of water as well. So this is the habitable zone. And we see there are no Earths. We have not found any Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of even these, of these stars. If you look closely, there's a little yellow dot that says, oh yeah, you did find one. That's true. But we then checked on that star because our survey was a quick survey, and we looked at the star in detail, we found that it was hotter and bigger, and consequently that planet was much hotter, and it was well out of the habitable zone. And we do that for these, these stars. We check to see if any of these truly are uh, in the habitable zone. And so we have quite a number of stars, of uh, planets here, that are super-Earths, and we work at confirming them, and, and that's what we'll see, I think, in the coming months and years, confirmation of some of these super-Earths. But we also have planets that are bigger, Neptune size, Jupiter size. We say, well, those, those can't have any Earths, can't have any life, because they're gas giants. But they can have moons. And like the mo in the movie Avatar, you have a planet, or really a large moon orbiting uh, these giant planets, and you could have an atmosphere, you could have life. Jupiter has four large moons. Maybe some of these have four large moons, and their atmospheres are all four. People living in all four, and they go from one moon to another, relatives, or for shopping, maybe for vacations. So they're all interesting to us, and they're all on our list at the confirm. I'm going to next give you a few statistics before I go on to more interesting things, but to give you a feeling, by the end of this month we'll have 3,000 candidates, most will be proven to be planets, and that we have found about 43 candidates in a habitable zone, most are larger than twice the size of probably, therefore not rocky, probably gas planets. The 20 are super Earth size, none are on super, uh, solar analog, so even though we find, uh, confirm them, you can't simply say you found exactly an Earth analog. There may be light, but it's not exactly like an Earth analog. And that's basically what, what this says all in all. And because of high stellar variability of stars like the sun, we're not going to get the final answers in four years, we're going to get them in eight years. So you have to be uh, patient. Okay, Kepler will end. It will end in a few years. If the reaction wheel quits tomorrow, it will end tomorrow. So what, what do we get from the Kepler mission? Certainly a huge uh, um, amount of information about oh, oh, thousands of uh, planets uh, can, and candidates. And what do we use it for? Well, the National Academy of Sciences has said 
We must have the answers from the Kepler mission. Are they common or are they rare? If they are common, we can build a mission. Uh, a mission that base would be based on uh, a, a cultures, for example, or coronagraphs that would look at the atmospheres and tell you what the composition is. If the Earths are, are rare instead of being common, you need a much bigger apparatus. You need uh, a set of interferometers that might uh, be able to look at many more stars. Well, the first mission is a very expensive mission. It would cost at least a billion, probably several billion dollars. Interferometers would be extremely expensive instead of very expensive. And so clearly, we need to know the answer before we build such missions. There may be some intermediate missions that I hope will fly, whether it's Plato or Tess, to find the nearest uh, planets around the nearest stars. Kepler, after all, is the discovery probe. So here's an example of what we might do in terms of finding, uh, seeing planets and getting light from other planets. Here is an idea that's been bandied about. We have a space telescope that looks at this particular star that uh, we believe have, have planets, but we also have a disk, an occulting disk, 30 to 100 feet in diameter, that happens to be directly in the light field of view that we place there, and consequently the telescope cannot see light from the star. But it can see light from around the edge, and so now it can see the planets. So now you get light from the planets. You've blocked out the star, you can see, and you can get the spectra of the planet. And, and what, you, what might you find? Here is what you might find if you look at the uh, brightness of that planet as a function of wavelength. Uh, the brightness is here of the planet, now not the star, and here's the wavelength. This is the infrared, and if you've got a nice smooth curve like this, no atmosphere, hot rock. If you've got a dip over here, that's water. That atmosphere has water in it. That atmosphere... Mm. Okay, I'm going to have to tell you the rest. Can the uh, person who's running the projector go back a couple figures, please? Oh, that's too far back. Keep going, please. Keep going. Right there, stop, please. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, basically, uh, if you have these bands that you see, uh, that says you've got CO2 in your atmosphere, you've got water in your atmosphere, that's great, you could very well have life. This is what plants need to live, water and CO2. So that plant might very well have life. If, on the other hand, it also has a little band here for ozone, ozone photochemical interchange with oxygen, this planet would be extremely interesting. It has oxygen as well as water and CO2, which should be an interesting atmosphere. This is the spectrum of our own atmosphere in fact. I'd like to do this carefully. Now, what, what are we going to do? We're going to find this, we're going to build this telescope. Our children will probably build this telescope in 2020 or something like that. But what do we do after that? One of the things that we can leave for our grandchildren is to build an even bigger telescope, an enormous telescope. Something like we're building on Earth, the OWL, the overwhelmingly large test, but put it in orbit. And now you can get enough photons that you can actually measure the reflectivity of the planet as a function of time of day. So if you were looking at <clears throat> the Earth, for example, over 24 hours, you would see the reflection, the brightness of the planet increase from uh, where the oceans were mostly present to where there's mostly land and, and some other smaller ocean and back down again. If, in fact, that planet uh, didn't uh, have any oceans, it was all land, it would look like, and that land was ice covered, you would see this very bright curve here, because ice would be high, much more reflective than land. If, on the other hand, what you had was a desert planet, it would look like this instead. But what if this planet were covered with jungle? Well, the curve would look like this over 24 hours. What if, instead, it was an all-ocean planet? Well, that would be very absorptive, and it would look like this. If, instead, the planet's uh, rotation axis is pointing in various directions, the curves would look different. So by 
building this overwhelmingly large telescope and measuring the reflectivity of the planets, you could tell quite a bit about what was happening in those planets. And this, I suspect, is what our grandchildren will build if they are uh, very ambitious in following their footsteps. Thank you.